Hello, 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 and welcome, one and all, to another edition of Heavy Hands. I'm Connor. That's Phil. Hello. Low to you as well, my dear friend. And uh, this is a big one. Feels like forever, really, since we've had uh, a really uh, big, weighty event to discuss. A big, meaty, thick, you know, uh, really sink your teeth. (laughs) A tumescent pay-per-view card. And uh, that is what we have before us today, UFC 298. Why, it's so good, they may as well have made this one UFC 300. <laughs> um, it's almost certainly going to have a better main event. Yeah, almost certainly, yeah. Uh, it really is a very stacked pay-per-view card. UFC 298, of course, that main event that Phil just mentioned is a featherweight title fight. Alexander Volkanovsky defending the strap against Ilya Tupuria, who I got to say is one of the most impressive title contenders uh, I think I've seen in a little while. Um, has really made some important statements on his way up and has looked impressive the entire time. That is a super exhilarating matchup. But the card doesn't stop there, because in the co-main event slot, we have Robert Whitaker taking on Paulo Costa. Both guys, I think, severely diminished uh, Costa more than Whitaker, uh, I think is fair to say. But still oh. an interesting fight with, uh, with uh, you know, even even setting the personalities of those two fighters aside. An interesting matchup. There's also Jeff Neal versus everyone's favorite, Ian Machado, Gary. And uh, Marab Dualishvili is taking on Henry Cejudo, who I guess is not just going to get title fights every three years from now uh, into forever, but is in fact taking on a, a, a fellow contender in the bantamweight division. Just an absolutely stacked main card, and it's not like there isn't some good stuff here and there on the undercard as well. This is uh this is what the Apex uh gives us, you know. Yep. You put all the absolute all dross. Of the, all of the good stuff has been taken out of all the other cards, and here it is. Yeah. Which is weird because I seem to recall there was a time when you would get pretty good fight night cards and really good pay per views, <laughs> but uh, for a confluence of uh, many different reasons, uh, instead what we seem to get is you get a pretty good travel card, maybe once every two months it seems. You get one really quite good pay per view, um, uh, at about the same rate, and then the other like two to three weeks of every month you see uh, middleweights fighting in an empty warehouse. That sums it up. Yep. So, where to start? I think it's obvious. The main event. Volkanovski, Tupuria. Um, yeah, I think this, this will take some doing, trying to get our heads around this fight. Not that we'll come up with an accurate prediction even once we have, but uh, a very, very interesting matchup. A lot of questions that... Um, both guys seem to pose a lot of questions that I'm I'm really not sure how the opponent uh, answers. Yeah, uh, this also this feels like one of the ones where we've got a lot of kind of exciting contenders waiting in the wings, mm-hmm. and a lot of tra- champions who, and no disrespect to them, feel somewhat transitional in nature at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think anyone is looking at almost any title, uh, any any champion at the moment, apart from Volkanovski and Makachev, and thinking, uh, wow, this guy is, is, you know, got the potential to be the greatest to ever do it in his division kind of thing. Or, or at the very least, champion. that they, they will reign for, they will have an era of their own. Yeah, maybe we're, we're talking champions where you, you'd cap most of these people at like two, three title defenses or whatever. Yeah, um, some of them may end up surprising us, but who knows? And 
Yeah, none of those sort of electrifying potential title challenges where they, you know, they've just sort of drifted away like Hamzat or they haven't yet got their shot like uh, Javkat or whatever. None of those guys have yet really got their shot. But Topuria is, I think, one of those fighters where it could genuinely feel like one of those, you know, passing of the torch moments where we have a... This guy has the potential to be a generationally great fighter yeah and even if he even if he doesn't he really feels like he has great potential to unseat the last one yeah right (laughs) yeah even if he doesn't he's still you know a sensationally gifted incredibly dangerous opponent for volkanovsky yeah and coming at a period in time i think where there are um understandably a lot more questions about volkanovsky's status than there ever have been Uh before. Volkanovsky is, uh, I think, past the now widely understood, uh, widely talked about 35-year age cutoff. Um, You know, I don't think it really takes a a huge uh, statistical analysis to determine that, you know, once you get past a certain age, you're just not going to be as good anymore. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know... Volkanovsky's aging. He just took a hard knockout loss on short notice. Uh, an event around which he was talking about dealing with depression and drinking and yep. not feeling good when he wasn't actively training and like basically getting obsessed about other more negative things when he didn't have the opportunity to be obsessive about preparing for his opponent, which he clearly is. Uh, so he's been going through it a little bit. He's aging. And we were both just discussing before we started here that, um, you can see a very definite trend over the course of Volkanovsky's impressive title reign of him sort of doing what you might expect out of both a long reigning champion and just an aging fighter in general. He's become less aggressive over time. He's a lot less willing to pressure. He's much choosier uh, about the shots he takes, more defensively minded in general. And like I said, I think that is a – that's just a, a mentality you develop when you've been holding a title for a while. You kind of have to. You're, you are literally in there defending something rather than striving for uh, anything you've not yet attained. Um And we've seen that with everybody from John Jones to Jose Aldo. Eventually, they sort of become – uh, they sort of settle into a, okay, you prove it mindset, uh, against most of their challengers. A show me mindset, maybe. And, but also he's just getting old, I think. And that's what happens when fighters get old. They become more reticent, more reluctant, more hesitant, uh, to throw and pickier, basically. Yeah, on the other hand, we have Tapuria, who is... Is he just fully undefeated, or is he just undefeated in the UFC? I think he's fully undefeated. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, it rarely makes a difference, you know. Sure. A lot he's... of the time you get one of these, like, super prospects who's got... In their first fight, they got tapped out by Joe Nobody because they just right, didn't right, know right. what they were doing. Uh, but yes, no, he is actually just 14-0. 14-0, 6-0 in the UFC. Yeah. So basically, by the numbers, this is the kind of fight where you would generally want to pick the challenger. Yeah. He is eight years younger, at the absolute peak of his confidence. Uh, he's incredibly violent and durable. He has no real gaps in his skill set uh, that, are, that, are, that look easily exploitable. Yeah, and I mean, not only is he um, undefeated both overall and in the UFC, but he is on almost entirely a finisher. Um, mm. and, and I think you could see that even in his last fight. It was his first decision since his UFC debut, but really a decision by the skin of Josh Emmett's teeth because yeah, he did everything in his power to completely murder the man and came very close on a number of occasions. I think he dropped him three times in the fight. 
destroyed his face and it's just that Josh Emmett is insanely tough uh, is the main reason that fight went the distance. So yeah, it, it just really feels like he's in position to be a guy to violently upset a long reigning champion. Yeah, and Volkanovski, and you know, we, we said this about uh, I think Andre Feely, even though we, you know, we picked him uh, last week, is that uh, he's one of those guys who is tough, but is obviously not, like, yeah. immortally durable. Yeah. Never been one of the, the traits that he's had. He's not John Jones. He can't just, you can't just go in there and be like, there is no chance this guy's getting knocked out if he's in his prime. Right. He got dropped because in even, his... you know, yeah, even when even when he was in his, you know, physical prime coming up to fight for the title, he was still getting dropped by like Chad Mendes and so on. Yep. Dropped by Chad Mendes, dropped a couple times by um Holloway. Obviously just got knocked out by Makachev. Uh yeah. So, I mean, let's let's focus on uh one of the two fighters. I think we're both in a position where we have plenty to say about each fighter as an individual. Saying what we expect from the fight, uh, I think will be the last thing that we can, we can determine. Um, let's talk about Ilya Tuporia a little more in depth. Uh, first of all, I love him. I love his game. He fights like the way I want everyone to fight. Uh, like the way Volkanovsky, I think, a little, used to fight and still fights to an extent, but, uh, Tuporia is a much more, he's a younger and therefore a much more violent man. More violent, more reckless, but all built on really sound fundamental technique. He is a remarkably good boxing technician by MMA standards. Like, uh, please, uh, Ilya, if you're listening, and I know you are, please don't take this the wrong way and win the title and then immediately challenge like Canelo Alvarez, <laughs> as I know you will be tempted to do, but I think Ilya Tuporia would actually be a pretty good boxer. Just a straight yeah. up boxer. Like he, he is actually that consistent and efficient and principled with his technique. Uh, the guy's got defense. He's got a jab. He's got footwork. Uh, he hits the body. Like he does all the things I want to see an MMA fighter doing on the feet. And then, uh, his last fight was such a huge statement of, maturity and discipline uh he basically went from a guy who was super impressive but himself very risky i mean you want to talk about mendez dropping volkanovsky Ilya tuporia got dropped by uh what's his name tall jai english herbert. guy yeah jai herbert um you know he, he got into some super reckless exchanges and got hurt in a couple of his ufc fights but you cannot say enough good things about the fact that he went in there against one of the sport's hardest hitters, pound for pound, and Josh Emmett, and not only didn't get hurt, but just completely dominated, put a lid on Josh Emmett, controlled him while beating the shit out of him for five rounds. It was a super, super impressive performance that instantly made him look like a serious championship contender. Um, so yeah, what's your take on uh, Ilya Tuporia? Yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, basically all of that stuff. Um, yeah, I think you know, the Emmett is someone who's incredibly matchup dependent. So what makes that so impressive is that yeah, Tuporia is not a bad matchup for Josh Emmett. So, Big punching, you know, boxy guys have had fights with Josh Emmett, and they've mostly been incredibly tough. Yep. You know, he's fought Calvin Cater and Cater and yep. uh, and Ige, who are all very skilled and have elements of, of Tapuria's skill set. And yeah, they they all just had like either like nip tuck, they all just had nip tuck like wars with him. Yep. But yeah, Tapuria just ran him out of the building. Yep. Um, just his. Defense, ability to like control the control the range, pull back, come back when he needed to, control Emmett with his own jab, and like counter with light shots when he needed to and hard shots when he wanted to. 
Yep. Yeah, he just Emmett just didn't have anything for him. And yeah, he does look like yeah, you know, as you said, one of the best boxers in the UFC at the moment. Yeah. I think the main thing that I think uh is a question mark with Topuria is obviously uh and you know, it sounds like his team knows this and are trying to address it, is the kicking game. Mm. This is what we have not really seen him up against. With the, you know, the sole exception of things like, well, the exception of things like that Jack, Jai Herbert fight, where he got booted upside the head during a wild yeah. exchange. He, he plied his own kicking game pretty well against Emmett. He, uh, mm-hmm. you know, shredded his, uh, his calf and his thigh with outside low kicks, played really beautifully off the thread of his right hand. But, um, yeah, he also took a lot of uh, really hard low kicks in return from Emmett. He didn't, he didn't show the effects of them as much as Emmett did. I think he's in better position mm-hmm. and more aware of what's happening to not just get blindsided by any technique. But, uh, yeah, it's obviously a big difference between Volkanovsky and most of his previous opponents is that Volk throws an absolute boatload of kicks. Yeah. Yeah, what, what is his t- thing is obviously that he's, he's, uh, he can, he, he's able to have a boxing match with people because the primary thing that people are going to want to do to take something away from the stand up is to take him down and he has both ironclad defense and yeah. is really good on top himself. Yep. Just a genuinely very good grappler. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's the, I think it's the kicking game for me, which is the concern. Uh, and also the feints, because yeah. this is, I think, where Volkanovsky differs greatly from, um, from like Josh Emmett in particular. Yes, because Josh Emmett is the definition of yes. a wind up and go fighter. He might shock you with his speed, you know. Uh, yeah, and he will f- find some ways to adjust that if the fight goes long enough. He will be forced to mm. mix up his timing. But for the most part, once you see the limits of Josh Emmett's speed, you've kind of seen you, you, you have a chance to get his timing no matter how fast he is. And he doesn't faint. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Tapuria did a ton of fainting against Emmett, but he had to deal with basically zero faints in return. And we know that as soon as Emmett can stop, he simply backed away. Exactly. And then Emmett would, would, would come forward like wading, you know, doing his wading Josh Emmett combinations and would eventually like find himself off at an angle and would get, and would get clocked. Yeah. And we know that Volkanovsky is an excellent fainter, uh, and could really do a lot to disrupt his opponent's timing without even having to touch them. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that as well. I want to talk a little bit about Ilya's performance against Emmett, though, just to just to like heap praise on all the incredible things he did. Like mm-hmm. the fact that he is an obviously superior athlete uh, really makes it so much more impressive to me. Just how much of his success in that fight was simply due to fundamental techniques. Real basic efficient shit. Like, the athleticism came through when he was, like, stringing combinations together. That's when you look and you're like, okay, this is because you are blazingly fast and you hit really hard and et cetera. You've got great timing, whatever. Whatever uh, intangibles you want to attach to that. That's when I think you can say, okay, this guy's a great athlete. You want to talk about how hard it was for Emmett to hit him in return? That wasn't because he has, like, supernatural... Um, reaction time or because he's in there, you know, doing crazy, like, you know, Roy Jones head movement with his hands down, etc. So many times, even very early in that fight, before he had a chance to even get Josh Emmett's timing, Tapuria evaded so many counters simply because he pivots after he hits you. Yep. Like, that basic technique did so much work for him. He would step in, maybe land a jab, maybe he would counter Emmett's jab, and then Emmett would try to extend the exchange, and he would throw a huge shot with everything he had behind it, and Tapuria simply would not be where he thought he was, 
but would still be lined up on Emmett well enough to come back after that swing and hit him with something small and simple and painful because Emmett had just swung for the fences and whiffed. The consistency with which Tupuria engaged and then just cut a very small, tidy angle. Um, didn't have to move his head. <coughs> Kept his hands up and his guard tight very diligently, but hardly needed it in these moments because the shots just went whizzing past his face simply because he pivots. He pivots, folks. Featherweight is the division of people who do <laughs> one of the most basic and essential bits of footwork that is nonetheless absent from so many MMA divisions. Volkanovsky pivots. Aldo used to pivot. And now we've got Tapuria. They all know how to turn on their lead foot, and it's beautiful because it's so very basic and so useful. Uh, the other big thing, of course, in that fight, Tapuria has a phenomenal jab. This is something I think that is a – I mean, it should be a genuine concern for Volkanovsky. Uh, mm -hmm. Who is the last guy Volkanovsky fought who had a great jab? Max Holloway. Max Holloway. Yeah. Jose Aldo. Aldo. Not necessarily in that fight. Uh, he just got cooked by feints for three rounds, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. And both of these guys have, you know, unequivocally great jabs. Yeah. Um, so... Go on. My main thing with kind of this fight as a as a setup and both like the pivot and the jab and all this other stuff is that and the general construction of Tapuria's game. And again, he has you know surprised us in the past with uh, you know how much he's improving and how physical he is and you know how much of a technical and clean fighter that he's become. Yep, is that. Pivoting and jabs have one solution. Both have kind of one solution in MMA, and that's low kicks. Um, one of the reasons why Volkanovski was able to keep Aldo's jab at home so much, and to an, and also Holloway, is that he yeah. just diligently attacked their lead leg. And he didn't do it with, and to put his general response to low kicks. Again, we haven't seen that many low kicks. Um, is uh, uh, like attempted against them is to counter them super hard. Yeah, he just he just steps in on a big counter, and not always super hard. I mean, he they tend to if you counter someone effectively off a low kick and it lands at all, it's going to have an impact. I think uh, when Emmett was low kicking him, Tuporia consistently just stuck the jab out there anyway, and would mm -hmm. just nail him straight down the middle. Uh, but obviously, yeah, that's a trade-off. Like, one of you is not going to be able to have that exchange forever without it uh, having yeah. an effect. And this is, and to me, this is sort of just the core of Volkanovsky's game, right? And it's basically what was kind of missing from that, at least as a striker. And it's what was obviously missing from the Makachev fight, because yeah. uh, Volkanovsky, well, because Makachev was cheating by being example. <laughs> yeah. And it shouldn't be allowed. that's unfair. Uh, but, like, yeah, against, like, uh, Topoya is one of those fighters who just, he just doesn't switch much. He's no. pretty much orthodox the entire time. Stays behind the left jab. Yep. And that just means that, like, Volkanovsky's gonna be able to run his old, like, his old favorite game of the three-way guessing game between faint, jab, and low kick. True. And that takes away the pivot, and it potentially, if he can get ahead on the game of, you know, on the game of feints and, you know, when you're gonna pull the trigger and when you're not, um, that, uh, it, yeah, it allows him to, like, neutralize him much as he did, much as he did Holloway. And I'm I'm not sure, like, despite all the physical, like, and just the trending advantages going Tapuria's way, I'm not sure that that's not a very tough style matchup for him to deal with. The other thing I think, uh, Jack Slack said this on Twitter recently, um, 
he says that like when Toporia is in exchanges, he does tend to just drop his hands. Like his defense is very good in neutral space, and like, but once he gets once he gets deep, he just he just leaves his hands by his side. And if your primary tactic against a low kick is to throw a massive counter, um. Panofsky has become, you know, the other part of him becoming older and picking his shots more is that he has become a very dangerous counterpuncher. True. Yeah. I don't know that I've noticed him um, dropping his hands so much as when he just really commits to a combination, they just are simply not by his chin because he's, he's slinging mm-hmm. them both uh, and, and not okay. worry. Not worrying about restoring his guard between shots at all. Um, yeah. which, which got him in trouble. He does it occasionally. There were, there are times when he, he would like, uh, pivot off and then put up a forearm or whatever against Emmett. But, um, but yeah. yeah, I think it was, it was a good call from Jack there. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it's certainly something he's, he's, con- the other thing is, oh, go on, go on. The other thing I was going to say is, I don't know how, don't know how Volkanovsky's new love for wrestling is going to play in this mm. at all. Not really. Like, because it's one thing to say that, like, Ilya Tapuria has ironclad takedown defense because he does. But also, Alexander Volkanovsky is not the wrestler that, uh, like, is, is by some by some margin a better wrestler than, like, Ryan Hall and Bryce Mitchell. Yeah, no question. Certainly a much stronger and, wrestler than uh, Bryce Mitchell, for example. Yeah, exactly. Um, like he, he probably doesn't have like the the complexity of Mitchell's top game. Yeah, or like the submission offense, but, but you, also or... Mitchell did get to pull you down. Yes, yes, he did. Um, so yeah, I mean that that is one that I have to expect will be there because I think Volkanovski does love taking people down now. I just I just do not know how that is going to play. Um. Like, what happens when these two guys... Go, I don't know what happens when these two guys clinch up. Yeah, I mean... My general feeling, uh, which is, a, I guess, a bit of a cop-out, is that it's probably kind of a wash. Because mm-hmm. even if Mitchell... I mean, to, to, just to, to clarify the comparison, I think Mitchell is also a more nuanced takedown artist than Volkanovsky. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Like, yeah, the, the dude is a really clever, multi-directional, multi-level takedown threat. He simply does not have Volkanovsky's physicality to back it up. Volk does not. Yeah, there uh, is, uh, no matter how clever he was, there would be no point in Bryce Mitchell's, like, life yes. where he could be hossing around Islam Makachev. Exactly, yeah, it would never happen. And I'm not saying that Volkanovsky is himself not a crafty takedown artist. It's not like he can't, you know, threaten a single switch to the double finish with a foot sweep. Like, he has layers to his wrestling as well, but... um, But the thing is, is that you have Bryce Mitchell, a very subtle, um, resourceful takedown artist, getting to pour you down, Complementing that with a, uh, as you said, a, a much better controlling top game, I think, than Volkanovsky has really demonstrated. And the result of it was, I mean, Taporia didn't immediately get back to his feet. He also was in no danger at all uh, against yeah, that I mean, dangerous well, it top was, game. It was like... It was what forty five seconds of top control before yeah. the end of the round. It was towards the end of the he didn't round. Didn't get yeah. back up. Yeah, no, he didn't. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah. again, it it wasn't it wasn't one of those ones where the guy who got taken down, you know, just immediately nullified it. It wasn't meaningless, essentially. No, true. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, what you would expect out of like a Jose Aldo fight. Yeah, yeah. where his hips just like somehow are like a the same a, a magnet with like the same. Uh, charge as the canvas that just like they, they refuse to touch the canvas. Hmm. The, the other thing that makes this one weird for me is that, uh, like makes it hard to, to pick for me is that, like, Volkanovsky does not 
typically like has not typically tended to like synthesize his uh like wrestling and striking approaches like that well. No, he's not one of these guys who's just gonna like hit one takedown every every round or right. try one takedown every round. Yeah. He clearly goes in with the plan against some people that he is going to wrestle with them. Yeah. Um yeah, so I mean it's just one of those things where I have to I have to bring it up because it's been such a big part of his his game against, you know, Rodriguez and Makajev. Sure. I fully expect it to be there. But I just don't know what's going to happen. No. I've, like, I, I mean, Mitchell's like... It, it might the, just be that, like, he just hosses Tapuria down like he did y- Yair Rodriguez. And and Tapuria's just never fought someone that's just that strong. That's yeah. Also, like, quite a good wrestler. I mean, Tapuria is a better wrestler than Yair Rodriguez. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a harder barrier to get through. I, I agree with you in that I have no doubt it will be a part of Volkanovsky's approach. It seems silly to go into a fight with a guy with the Taporia's boxing and not have a few alternatives to just having a boxing match with him uh, up your sleeve. But uh I'm just going to go ahead and stick with my feeling that it's Aside from the effect it might have on the striking, uh, I will point out that when Mitchell did get to pour you down, it was a single leg played off of the threat of boxing. Taporia started using his head movement and uh, got himself I think into. People should use single legs more in MMA. Oh, it you're the only o- legs. only guy I've ever heard express that opinion. Why do you uh, think that? And here, let me argue uh, with you about it for the next 25 minutes and then periodically through the rest of the entire show. You're only saying that because you like double legs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only saying that because I'm normal and you're some kind of freak who, you know, most of us can't do what you do. But whatever, go on. Tell me about how everyone can do it. Everyone can't. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was, you know, it's the kind of thing that Volkanovsky certainly can do. He got Taporia to uh, really plant his feet, which is what happens when you move your head. You kind of got to slot in little uh, small steps between your slips and rolls and ducks. Uh, and otherwise, your feet are pretty planted and, and you are ripe for a takedown. And... Um, but, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and assume, uh, that Volkanovsky is not going to be able to just cleanly out wrestle and then out grapple to Poria. Um, I think it might, it, it may just have an effect on the striking will be its, its biggest use that it may slow to Poria's role. It may force him to fight at a longer distance. It might help Volkanovsky's kicking game to be more effective as a result. But I kind of have a hard time just seeing him out grappling Taporia en route to a win, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure about this one. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, anything could happen. Seems. Um. Again, I I do feel like a big part of why uh, Volkanovski chooses to wrestle with people is when they're cheating, and he feels like he. Yeah. He can't strike with them because they're cheating. Uh, like Rodriguez was doing that a lot, uh, putting like his his uh, yeah his left leg behind him instead of in front of him. And Volkanovski was like, "Man, I need to grab this guy. Don't punch him. That's impossible." <laughs> so, um, so then your conclusion is that he won't do it against Tapuria at all. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's basically what I, the conclusion that I've come to is that he only really tries to wrestle. <laughs> South he only really has a concerted effort to wrestle people who go open stance with him. Yeah, <laughs> Tapuria doesn't do that. He's, he's like, how could you possibly strike like this? Yeah, this is bullshit. Yeah, Tapuria is too committed to that left jab, man. It is. He's, you know, he's just got such a principled boxing game. Why go southpaw when you can box? Mm-hmm. Unless you were just naturally left-handed, there's no excuse. Um, I mean, because maybe it would allow you to win. 
as uh, no, that's fake. Joe Pfeiffer possibly could have learned last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> could have literally just come in with the worst Southpaw yeah. boxing game of all time and just beat Jack Hermanson on pure physicality. I mean, shit, as it was, it took Jack Hermanson the better part of two and a half rounds to discover his jab against an orthodox opponent. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that might have been something worth trying. But we're not talking about middleweights. For God's sake, it's enough. <laughs> I was I was running out of jokes in the to make in the title about how many middleweight fights we were discussing, Phil. Enough. That's for the bonus episode. Um, I, I want to... I, so, I, I, yeah, but... Yeah. My other thing about, yeah. Whilst I'm going to come to the conclusion that Volkanovski's wrestling game is probably not going to be effective in this fight, I do think it might be a reminder of why Volkanovski is such a good striker. Yeah. The well roundedness and, um, and the way that different parts of the game inform the others is a strength. Yep. Um, I do want to go back, um, to your point about the uh, the low kicks taking away the jabs and pivots, um, when we talk about something taking away a strike, that sounds on paper a lot more definitive than it is in reality. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a sort of conversation, like all conversations in fighting which is affected by factors like athleticism and durability and youth and all the sort of fearlessness and reckless aggression and risk, calculated risk taking that comes with that. And like the thing is, like how do you take away a fighter's right hand, for example? Well, you might just feed him a bunch of jabs. You might make him use that right hand for defense. That's its job. Another lesson Joe Pfeiffer might have learned before he fought Jack Hermanson. The right hand is there for something other than hitting the guy. Uh, no, no. The, the, we're not talking about middleweights. The right hand is there to pick off the jab. Uh, and so you might just try to really, really occupy that right hand. Give the guy a ton of jabs. Maybe give him some left hooks as well so he's got to focus on whether he wants to catch in front or cover up to the side. And really just try to restrict his usage of that right hand to the role of defense. And then you're going to do that against somebody like um, Dan Ige, who just like drops levels and times your jab and crushes you with the very right hand you were trying to neutralize. Um, I think the same is true when you're talking about low kicks taking away both jabs and pivots. Like, they can. What if they don't? What if they are not merited the, the right level of respect by Taboria to have that effect. Because like I said, Josh Emmett had some success with low kicks against Tapuria. Not as much as Tapuria himself had, but he had some con- considerable success. And they were beaten out of his game because when they did land, Tapuria just stabbed him in the face. And then the pressure increased. And then Emmett had to spend more time going backwards and more time worrying about shots coming at his head this is the thing when you're like using a counter with the objective of taking something away is you might just get countered back and not actually remove that from the opponent's arsenal. Uh, I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm skeptical is what I'm saying because I just saw Volkanovsky knocked out. I've seen him hurt. I know that by a cheater. Well, yeah, fair enough. But I know that also by Chad Mendez, a different kind of cheater. Um, I, uh, and I know that Tapuria is younger and just innately more ferocious and that his response to Volkanovsky trying to neutralize him is not going to be the response of like an old Jose Aldo. How do I solve this puzzle? Tapuria is more than capable of taking calculated risks. In fact, before the Josh Emmett fight, I would say he was incapable of taking calculated risks, but very capable of taking lots of risks in general. Against Josh Emmett, he showed a really keen understanding of where he was in the fight. He managed his pace beautifully. Um, and, uh, 
and just did not really I mean, for fuck's sake, the only time he let the momentum slip away from him in that Josh Emmett fight, uh, after he seized it partway through round one, was in round five where he knew Josh Emmett was going to come out swinging for the fences, which he did, and he basically just let him burn out his tantrum, <laughs> like, which I loved seeing, a very experienced fighter move, very much a, a move uh, beyond Tapuria's years. He was like, ah, oh, you know, like, I could insist on pressuring you still and, like, try to meet, uh, you know, steel with steel, but uh, I'm just going to let you swing yourself out a little bit. Okay, let it out. He practically held Josh Hammett's hair back for him. He was very polite in how much mm-hmm. he just sort of let him swing for the fences. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, like, there is a point in a fighter's career where all the opponents are cheating. Because they're all younger. And all of your uh, tactical tricks and all your game planning can just run up against the hard barrier of the other guy not caring enough for those things to work as well as you want them to. That is my fear and sort of my gut feeling about Tupuria here. Is that Volkanovsky is insanely crafty. He is still a very good athlete himself, no question. But... He is more reliant than ever on his craft doing the job for him and more reluctant to just dump a good portion of athleticism in there uh, to just, you know, like sometimes it's not about tactics. It's about will and force and uh, refusal to back down. It's about being willing to gamble. And I have the feeling Tapuria is just at a point in his career where he's way more willing to gamble way more often than Volkanovsky. I don't know. Just yeah, a, just a it's feeling. More than fair. As, as I said, I think, you know, if you look at the intangibles around this fight, you should, uh, like, it definitely just says just don't pick Alexander Volkanovsky. Yeah. He's coming off a bad lock, knockout. He's old as hell. He's been, uh, like, yeah, talking about suppression, all this other kind of stuff. Uh, if you're just going on a vibes pick, just stay away from Alexander Volkanovsky. And he hasn't really fought uh, anyone again, remotely like Tapuria. I mean, that's the other part of my concern. It's just like... I mean, sort of Chad Mendes, but you could argue that's one of his toughest fights. It's one he of his toughest. Like, and, he was and, a much worse fighter back then. Yeah, and Chad Mendes is a much more limited striker than Tapuria. And, and way less effective with those stone-cold fundamentals. Like, Chad Mendes doesn't have a jab. Mm-hmm. You know, his, he can't, he can't stay on pressure because he doesn't have a jab. He's got to let you back in because he needs to counter you to get in. Uh, Taporia can, can put a lid on you. He can keep you caged if the opportunity presents itself. Uh, Chad Mendes never had that ability. So yeah. I don't know. It, it's, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, intangibles and vibes. Like I said, it's, it's all, um, Tapuria. For me, I, I just kind of feel like a front foot heavy, basically a front foot heavy boxer is one of those things that Volkanovsky is simply built to beat. This is his, like, sorry, a front foot heavy, let me clarify that, orthodox boxer. Yeah, 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 thanks, thanks, thanks. Is one, of those, one of those things that Volkanovsky is built to beat. Like, because, yeah, as you said, you know, you can... Uh, you know, the idea of kind of taking things away depends on who is, who is essentially reading the opponent correctly. A jab is a counter to a low kick as much as a, a low kick is a counter to a jab. Exactly. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but Volkanovsky's ability to play his feints off his jab, off his low kick, and to mix them, the three of them together, is essentially the, well, the best we've ever seen. In this sport, at least. Yep. And, I know, I know, like, Tapuria's team seem very smart and they're aware of, like, this as a threat. For sure. But it's not the same as fighting someone like that. And I just think, like, it is it is one of those matchups where, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, I think that despite how good I think Tapuria is, I think his game is not built 
to beat Alexander Volkanovsky. All right. Well, that sounds like a pick to me. I'm going to, I think I have to. Again, on vibes, wouldn't touch Volkanovsky with a barge pole. Yeah. I am, uh, I'm feeling the vibes. And again, while I, I certainly agree with that to an extent, I, I do genuinely think this is a new level of sophistication to those problems that Volkanovsky is used to solving. I really think it is genuinely because there are so few fighters doing what Tapuria is doing, sadly, in MMA mm. right now. And I mean, shit, I would say like the last one was Volkanovsky himself <laughs> who was in there, you know, against like Korean zombie. I think that was like maybe his prime pure boxing performance uh, against an obviously very far from prime opponent. But um, it's difficult for me to say how well tailored Volkanovsky's game is to deal with somebody who pressures methodically, who really pays attention to his defense, who super heavily relies on a very sharp and effective jab, uh, and who is himself... You are describing Jose Aldo here. Not the one Volkanovsky fought, though. This is the thing. What uh, was, was that was that Jose Aldo super bad? He went on to have tons of great performances down a weight class. Sure he did. Sure he did. But it was not... It was just not a good showing from Jose Aldo. I mean, how much of that can you attribute entirely? It's it's It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not just... Uh, Aldo didn't get off because Volkanovsky did such a brilliant job of putting a lid on him. Aldo was at a point in his career, uh, or was in a point in that, in that fight alone that he was simply not willing to take the risks that would have been required to turn the momentum in that fight. There's only. It also, it also says that like, Aldo wasn't like an, he was, an incredibly subtle and deep fighter, and he wanted to have a, you know, yes. he basically wanted to have a control fight with Volkanovsky where he could stay ahead, because that's how Aldo Fop had been fighting for the last however many years. Yes. And he couldn't even come close to doing that. No. You're right. But I don't think you like, can... It just shows you how good Volkanovsky can be at that kind of style matchup. I agree. But I think you can you can make a mistake when you sort of um, you sort of compile all the various looks Jose Aldo has given throughout his very long career into one guy and assume that he's all of those guys on one night and say that he's fighting to the very best of his ability and therefore that shows how effective Volkanovski is at controlling uh, jabby counterpunchers. Uh, some of that does come down to where Aldo was at that particular moment. And I think you could make a very good case to an that... Extent, but, like, no one, he has, no one has ever made Jose Aldo look that bad. No, it, it's absolutely until, true. Like, until, like, he was shot shot. Yeah, you know I'm not talking shit about Volkanovsky. You know I hold him in extremely high esteem. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, a perhaps the Aldo who, after that fight, I think you could argue was sort of reinvigorated and wanted to go out there and make statements uh, and became hungry in a way that he had sort of lost a bit towards the end of his title reign, etc. Um, you could argue that the Aldo who went down to bantamweight and was in there fighting Pyotr Jan, if he had taken that approach to Volkanovsky, just accepted some 50-50 exchanges, maybe then he would have created some chances at winning. It was not a gambling Jose Aldo we saw in that fight, not remotely. He didn't take one gamble all fight long. He did try swinging at Volkanovski. It just never, it just never worked. Yeah, he couldn't I, like because Jan was just there to brawl with him when he did that thing of like, you know, let's punctuate a fight with a big exchange yeah. kind of Aldo Aldo thing against Volkanovski. It just just never happened. Yeah. And he just kept steadily losing a control performance. Yep. I don't know, man. It is hard for me to picture um, young, ferocious Ilya Tupuria just allowing the uh, the door to be locked on him like that. Like, 
you you can force a war. <laughs> it's it's difficult to avoid a war if the opponent really really wants one. Uh, yeah, but it might just be a war that you just start losing. <laughs> could true. Yeah, but I'm gonna go with the vibes. I'm gonna go with mm-hmm. the younger man again. Can't 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 uh, say that it's not. You know that the vibes aren't generally just like a good a good way of picking fights. There's a feeling in the air, and you can't deny it. Mm-hmm. And Tuporia yep. seems ready, and he just had a career best performances, which I don't even know if we commemorated at the handies, but was surely one of the most impressive performances of that entire year. Uh, oh. Just in what a huge step up it was against such a tough opponent. Uh, and even outside the context of Tuporia's previous fights, just it was just like, I mean, it was like a Whitaker Gastelum type of. Uh, entertaining beatdown, except that Emmett's better than Kelvin Gastelum <laughs> by a long shot, so uh I mean Yeah. He's better than he's better than Kelvin Gastelum. He's, he's Come definitely on. better than he's definitely better than Kelvin Gastelum. I don't know if he's a lot better than Kelvin Gastelum. He's considerably. You know, give me that. Let me let me find a middle ground here. Come on. It's <laughs> it's Kelvin Gastelum we're talking about for fuck's sake. Um yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, uh, I would love to see it, man. Seeing Volkanovsky just use like get craft and guile to deny Tupuria, uh, a disciplined and, but exciting fight. But, um, I don't know. I, I think there's going to be a serious tension and intensity brought by, uh, Tupuria throughout the fight. There'd be very high stakes. I do not think he is going to, uh, concede the momentum because Volkanovsky is hitting him with like inside low kicks. I think he will try to extend exchanges. But then again, you would say exactly the same thing of like Max Holloway. True. You would before you had seen Max Holloway ever fight That is true. Uh fight Volkanovsky, you'd be like, it is impossible to dissuade this man. That is true. And in fact, Volkanovsky oh. didn't really dissuade him all that much, but he did completely fucking cook him. <laughs> he made him pay more and more for his redoubled efforts to bring the action. You're absolutely right. Volkanovsky is an all-time great fighter. He's one of the most well-rounded and clever fighters we have ever, ever seen in the sport. Uh, I'd love to see him do it again. But, yep, going with my gut on this one. I'm feeling Ilya Tuporia. All right. Well, that is more more than enough uh, of a segment for a very, very intriguing fight. When we come back, we're basically just going to run down the rest of this card. Robert Whitaker, Polo Costa, uh, Marab Dwalishvili, Henry Cejudo. Uh, what's the other one? I'm not looking at the card right now. Uh, Jeff Neal, Ian Gary. That's right, that's right. And then, like, Fluffy Hernandez, Roman Kopolov is there as well. That'll probably be a bonus. We do like Roman Kopolov and Fluffy Hernandez, though, so we will definitely talk about yep. that one for the Patreon. Um, all right, let's take a break. When we come back, Bobby Knuckles, Paulo Costa, and the rest after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands, the co-main event of UFC 298, Robert Whitaker versus Polo Bohashinya Costa. And, um, I, I mean, I know you just said while we were, uh, gearing up for this discussion, Phil, it shouldn't take too long. You sort of implied this is a simple fight to break down. I would have, I gotta say, an easier time breaking it down if this were three years ago. Oh, well, then again, would you? then again, Paulo Costa was better three years ago. So, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah they've sort of <laughs> Paulo Costa has sort of done his best to sort of stay ahead. Uh, it appears of Robert Whitaker's decline. 
Yeah, fair enough. Okay, well, tell me about it then. You've got a you've got a clear read. Uh, Paulo Costa has looked like shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, since he was summarily broken by, and I've realized this now, Joel Romero. Yeah. But enough about Paulo Costa's hairline. How does his fighting game look? Uh, the same. <laughs> no, I mean, Patchy. I'm thinking about it. Maybe it was Yal Romero that broke him. No, I that that makes sense to uh, me. Or we've been giving we've been giving credit to Adesanya all this time, and it just that just wasn't real. Maybe it was Yoel. Maybe it was him throwing all his offense at someone and like him body kicking someone like ten thousand times, and then a this immortal ageless monster simply coming back in the third round and coming after him. I, and after that, Paulo Costa has just never been the same. I, I think um, you, you could perhaps pin it on both of those fights together. Yeah, that like Yoel is a, oh my god, like all the incredible stuff I do that has crushed everyone just isn't crushing this guy. And then perhaps mm-hmm. coming in with that in his mind, having devised what he thought was a very crafty approach to Israel Adesanya, which just allowed Israel Adesanya to carve him apart uh, cut by cut. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're talking a Paulo Costa who, like, had the genesis of being, like, a super promising pressure fighter. Yep. You know, someone who rips to the body with both his hands and, like, an open side body kick. Mm-hmm. Someone who just has relentless pressure, a, a great chin, who's like very aggressive at fighting off takedown def- attempts and so on and so forth. And someone who is now uh, all of those things, but has somehow become like prematurely old and frustrated yeah. and uh, like bitter and kind of haggard with the way that he's going about it. Yep. You know what? Actually, new theory. I don't think it's either of the fights. I think it literally is the hair. Yeah, like a Samson thing. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm buying it. I think it's just broken his youthful confidence. You know, he just had like, this was a man with mm-hmm. zero self-doubt whatsoever. And now he has to look in the mirror every morning and apply a chalky substance to hide just how much of his scalp is showing through his hairline. You know, he he's like he's got the like hairline markers and stuff. I'm pretty sure at the start of the Luke Rockhold fight, you can see a little bit of what looks like dye running down his forehead right at the start. <laughs> so I think it was just the hair. I think the fights are actually irrelevant. <laughs> and he's simply yeah. lost the confidence that comes with a good head of hair. Yeah. So... I mean, yeah, because it's one of those weird things where, like, he doesn't actually look like he's lost that much of a step physically. No. He certainly looks like he's getting tired more. Uh, yeah. Um, but even then, like, uh, that fight with Vittori, that was a really hard fight, and he looked like he was gassing after one round, but he didn't really gas. He was still going full tilt for most of that fight. Yeah. Did Phys- he not, like, win the last round? Yeah. Physically, I would say he still looks very imposing, and against a really meat and potatoes fighter like Vittori, that's after Adesanya and Romero, and that physicality still came through. At the very least, made that a very tough fight uh, for Vittori. Yeah. So. I mean, again, it was it was that dynamic of just like, I am physically above you, Marvin Vittori. Yeah. And just hanging around with me has tired you out. Yeah. And somehow that feeling of. Uh, just like unbreakable physical dominance was not enough for him to look even slightly good against Luke Rockhold, <laughs> whose, whose hairline is like several years behind Costa's in the battle against his forehead. Um, and who fought really a terrible fight by and large. And, uh, and still just Costa got tired and wasn't very active. He seemed maybe a little freaked out by Rockhold's size, even though Rockhold doesn't do a whole lot to use that frame. And the fact that Rockhold was losing his mind. Yeah, Rockhold uh, finally released that last uh, little finger grip on his sanity and just decided to go in there and die, if that's what it took. Mm-hmm. But uh cost to look like shit, is the point. And so, you... and, uh, yeah, this was the Luke Rockhold whose knees were gone. And 
Um, he also uh, fought Marvin Vittori, who's basically just a boxer, and even then... A very uh, limited boxer. Vittori, like, mostly torched him in the pocket until Vittori just got tired of punching him. Uh, and then Costa kind of begrudgingly hauled his way back into the fight. He was like, <laughs> I guess I'm here and I've got to do it. <sighs> yeah. He just started, like, physically overpowering Vittori. But, I mean, like, the main thing is, is that um, his his pure aggression is gone. And without that, yeah. why is he not simply a target for kicks? Yeah. Like, surely Robert Whittaker is simply just going to boot him from range, much like he did to... Well, Marvin Vittori, he's just going to kick him up. Yep. Target for kicks, target for jabs. There's also the fact that uh, almost all of Vittori's success against Costa was on the counter. Mm -hmm. Whitaker, not a great counter puncher across the board. It's contextual with him. Yep. But certainly the more comfortable he gets, the more counters he will find, the more big swings he has shown. You know, i.e., the only kind of strike Costa knows how to throw anymore, and uh, he can certainly find counters too. The concern is, uh, from my side, is pretty obvious. I think Whitaker's also yeah. aging. Yep. Uh, getting hurt basically every fight, a telltale sign of a fighter's uh, irreversible decline. He just gets hurt every time now. Uh, you know, it was, it was like watching Michael Johnson last weekend. And of course he really, there was the moment where he really tried to lose by getting out grappled right at the end and somehow oh, pulled it so hard. Yes. But he also, there were like three or four points in that fight where I was pretty sure he got chinned and did a good job hiding it, but was mm. just like, yeah, anything would touch his chin. And he was like, Oh shit. You could see a little moment of panic and disorientation in his eyes. Uh, cause he's old and that happens. You just can't take a shot forever. And I think Whitaker is uh, is there as well. I mean, who was the who was the last guy not to hurt him? Was it Vittori? Yeah, I who? mean, Vittori still like he's Whitaker was still struggling a bit with Vittori early. I yeah, don't know if he that's got hurt that's not but that's true. Just the pressure. Uh, yeah, Adesanya hurt him. Drakus obviously hurt him. Gastelum didn't hurt him because Gastelum is, as we both agreed, much worse than somebody like say Josh Emmett. Jared Cannonier hurt him. Darren Till hurt him. Adesanya hurt him before that. Of course, the Romero fights. It's basically like, unless he's fighting basically the UFC equivalent of a can, he's, he's getting, he's getting dazed at least once in most of these fights. Uh, yeah. Or Martin. I mean, okay. You know what? This has made me weirdly more encouraged for Robert Whittaker. <laughs> you just described like the entirety of his prime. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Maybe it doesn't mark as much of a decline. He's always been shitty. I mean, fuck, he got knocked out by yeah. Stephen Thompson in 2014. Yep. He got hurt by Colt McGee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That settles it. Robert Whitaker is the pick. Um, yeah. I think it kind of, it kind of has to it be. It just has to be. You can't pick Paul Acosta over, over, over Robert Whitaker and certainly not this version of Paul Acosta. Still, I would have, I would have loved to see this fight three or four years ago. Oh yeah, I think been sensational. Yeah, uh, 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 Costa with a still an as yet unbroken will, um, willing to spend his durability against a much sharper, more confident Robert Whitaker. I mean, that would have been a sick fight. Still, would really like to see Drakus uh, against Costa though. Well, it's never going to happen. I feel like the dynamic of like the two of them both getting extremely tired. That would be great. For how much Brikus would confuse Costa. <laughs> it's never going to happen because Drikus is going to be champion for the next 25 years. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Unfortunately. And Costa also because uh, Costa is, I mean, and this is the other, like the main reason why you really just cannot pick him. He doesn't seem very interested in fighting. Anymore. No, he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it is a confluence of all the factors we've discussed, but I think that has sort of been the case 
for a while. He just sort that of is really is really the crux of it is that you're getting the impression yeah. he has to be dragged kicking and screaming to these fights because he needs the money. Pretty much, yeah, that's how it seems. At the very least, I think whether or not Robert Whitaker still loves it as much as he did, he does still seem just personally driven to be good at it, and that that counts for a mm-hmm. lot. All right. Well, that's enough on that one. We're both picking Bobby Knuckles. Uh, prepare uh, yourself now, Phil, to be utterly devastated <laughs> because of this vote of confidence when Paulo Costa inevitably knocks him out with like a left hook. But, yeah, you know, he's a huge, he's a huge middleweight and Bobby Knuckles isn't and he's Jenny. Yeah. You trying to pretend yeah. to me you're not going to be distraught and, and, and disappointed and saddened if that happens? Don't lie to me. You know what? I don't think I will be. Oh, come on. I know you run the glue factory. Because I won't find, I won't think there's anything meaningful in it. I'll just be like, oh, well, that happens sometimes. Okay. So it's that you're, you're taking comfort in the shield of cognitive dissonance. Like, it's definitely not going to happen. Sometimes Bobby Knuckles is going to fight a big puncher, and when they buzz him, they're just going to finish him. Like, you know, Jared Cannonier could have finished him at the end of their fight. He yep. came very close to doing it. Yep. Uh, and I would have been like, oh, Jared Cannon is much worse than Robert Whittaker. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Let's uh, let's move on then to our next fight. I think we've got time in this segment to discuss welterweights Jeff Neal and Ian Machado Gary. And I insist on saying the uh, the second surname because Ian Gary's many adoring fans really love his insistence on uh, using that name. They don't, they don't consider it a sign of um, cuckoldry or anything like that. Mm-hmm. No. This is, by the way, this is uh, after getting all butthurt about the guy accusing me of watching embedded. My, my new thing, Phil, I think is going to be starting to actually watch that stuff. And then just filling you in each time Ian Gary fights, I'm going to give you another detail about his personal life because you seem so interested in learning about it. Please no. <laughs> it's uh, it's a, a rich it's vein. Let me enjoy his fights. Yeah. And fast forward to his post fight interviews. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Anyway, what do you make of this matchup? Pretty cool one, I think. It's one of those ones where. Uh, it's an interesting, like, ask of Gary's clearly very good ability to solve style matchups. Yeah. Because, like, Jeff Neal is a quite limited fighter, but not necessarily in the ways that, like, should be easily exploitable for someone like, uh, like Gary. Because no one's really managed to have like an, a, an easy fight against Jeff Neal in the UFC, with the possible ex- exception of Wonderboy. Yeah, Stephen Thompson. That's the one. So I guess the thing is, can, uh, uh, can Ian Gary just replicate that performance? I think he might try. We, well, one thing we know about Ian Gary, uh, one of the many things I know about Ian Gary, for now... <laughs> the one thing you know about him <laughs> is uh, that he prepares really diligently for his opponents. Yep. He's a, he's a real student of the game. He has a pretty, I mean, to use a flattering term, paired down skill set. There's only really a few mm-hmm. things Ian Gary likes to do in the cage. Uh, but it's a very flexible skill set, moldable to a lot of different sort of approaches, whether he's going to be aggressive and relying on his boxing or he's going to maintain distance and lean on his kicks, uh, whether he's going to hold his ground or he's going to be evasive. We have seen fights, um, some pretty good fights. In fact, I think the first genuinely impressive performance from my perspective that Ian Gary put on was um, really a back foot anti-pressure showing against uh, Gabe Green. That was what sold me on Gary, and he dealt with a like archetypically aggressive, um, aggressive swarming pressure fighter, mostly off the back foot, and really kept his cool. Did a pretty damn good job with his footwork. 
uh, to constantly make the pressure fighter readjust his feet and really kept him honest with the jabs and the other straight shots up the middle. Um, so I won't be surprised at all if that is the approach that Ian Gary hits on for this fight, given that, as you said, it's, it's really the only lopsided loss Jeff Neal has ever taken. Um, and why is that? I mean, Jeff Neal's footwork just isn't particularly good coming forward. Mm -hmm. He has really never shown an ability to cut off the cage. Um, and there's also the fact that we know about Jeff Neal. Um, he's largely a a one handed fighter, not to the extent of like an Andre Arlovsky. And there have been a couple pretty damn close though. But he as he's as close as you could possibly get away with at welterweight, I think. Uh unless yeah. you were just a gen, like a generational physical freak of some kind to just have such a limited game. But yeah, that obviously um being a southpaw who's so left-hand dependent is going to hurt you. Um when you're trying to corral an evasive opponent around the cage. So I don't know. If I'm assuming that's the kind of approach from Gary, I can definitely see it working. Yeah, he looks perfectly competent against uh, in the open starts matchup. And yeah, I'm assuming he's just going to circle to the left and then uh, Gary, and then uh, Jeff Neal won't be able to hit him. Yep. Uh, Gary still jabs southpaws. He does. He did against... Um, uh, Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, he's just going to move left into a space which simply doesn't exist for Jeff Neal. <laughs> the space of his, around his like right shoulder. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's gonna he's gonna jab him. He's gonna pull him into counter shots. He's probably going to turn him into a bunch of body kicks. Um, yeah, like I, I think he's just going to solve him again. It's another it's another example of like a well booked Ian Gary fight. Uh, of him show, showcasing that he can like can solve the puzzle box put in front of him, yeah, because he's seen other people do it. Yeah, Ian Gary is maybe the fighter who most um, makes welterweight look like middleweight. Yeah, he he he's been very effective at tailoring his own approach so that he can force the opponent into a fight where they only know how to do like half of it. Where they're just yep. super restricted uh, in their options, and uh, yeah, it is also kind of amusing that like uh, his all his signature wins, and also like his personality. Like you could really summarize all of this kind of stuff as copying other people's homework. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, in school you get in trouble for that. In, uh, in any kind in, of. In MMA, it makes you a tactical genius. Yeah. Or in any kind of, uh, creative pursuit of which, you know, like developing your fighting game is, it, it involves some creativity. You know, you hear a good chord progression in a song, you use it and write a different song. Mm-hmm. You, you see a cool use of light in a painting. If you're a painter, you're going to use that in your painting. You just, you just steal from the best. And there's, Really very good sense in that. Even more so in MMA where, uh, I would say 95% of fighters never ever successfully solve that one style matchup they can't seem to win. Mm-hmm. You know, in boxing, you expect more of that. In kickboxing, you expect more successful adjustment, more of an ability to fight against type. For a variety of reasons in MMA, uh, you know, I mean, really, it should make the sport much easier to predict than it is <laughs> because there are a lot of fighters where you just kind of get a, you get the book written on them and it, that book never changes. So yeah, uh, the only yeah. thing really. And Jeff Neal is 100% one of them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a very impressive fighter, but ultimately a very limited one. The only thing, um, that should be any concern is that Jeff Neal is, Jeff Neal is really fast. And hits very hard. And we know in a Jack Hermanson type of way can look like overwhelmed mm-hmm. at points in the fight, but will fight his ass off yep. and just go for broke 
if uh, if needs be, like uh, something that somebody like, say, Neil Magny is not really capable of doing in the same way. Not that Magny can't get a comeback, as we saw recently. Yeah, I but, was going to say. But, but it was not a, uh, you know, that was not a, okay, it's wow. the third round, I'm losing, I'm going to go apeshit the entire time. It was like literally 45 seconds of success, which relied on the opponent utterly collapsing. Yep. Jeff Neal, uh, like Jack Hermanson, will just engage in a war if he has to. If it seems like the only yep. re- reasonable path to victory, Ian Gary has been chinned a couple of times. Uh, we've seen him dropped. He recovers well, doesn't get discombobulated, but still, it's there. It's something to think about. Still got to pick Ian Gary. Yep. Yep, you kind of have to. All right. Well, let's take one more break. When we come back, we have some bantamweights to talk about. Marab Dualishwili, Henry Cejudo, after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Uh, Finally on to our last fight of this episode, the second to last fight on the main card, or just second, depending on how you look at it. Henry Cejudo, Mirab Duwalishwili. We're in a weird position thinking about this fight, Phil. Mm-hmm. because it feels like it's difficult to know exactly what to expect, what to predict. And that is almost entirely down to Cejudo being a guy that I never seem to really understand perfectly. Yep. Because as for Marab, I think we have a pretty good idea of what to expect. Um. And what we're expecting is, uh, frankly, like unbelievable, incredible. Like, yeah, that that's my that's my real problem with this one is that I know what to expect from Marab, but I don't know what its limits are. Yeah, I mean, we were just looking at simply, uh, like his cardio is simply one of the most unquantifiable, ridiculous things I've ever seen in MMA. Yeah. Yeah, it seems it like the, be the most ridiculous, the most ridiculous single physical trait I've seen in this sport. It's pretty. It's up there for sure. It's it is the Carlos Condit's chin of gas tanks. Uh, because it's not like Marab is far from the only fighter who routinely fights at a a high clip, and who is like known for never getting tired. You can think of a lot of fighters right now off the top of your head who meet that description who make that the cornerstone of their game. A lot of pace fighters in MMA is what I'm saying. None of them are burning uh, that apparently like limitless resource of gas as recklessly as Marab, though. This man, we were just looking at his stats. UFC stats credits him with 49 takedown attempts over five rounds against Piotr Jan. And while, I mean, which is an absurd number, like that is genuinely higher than the strikes thrown <laughs> in some uh, tepid like women's bantamweight fights. That is like an outrageous number of a very energy costly technique, shooting, changing levels, dropping to the ground, wrestling with the guy's center of gravity. Like takedowns take so much more energy uh one to one against like any punch or kick you can think of throwing. Like it's not even worth comparing. There's so much more intense uh, on the stamina reserves. Nobody goes for 49 takedowns in a 25 minute fight. It's two takedowns a minute. Oh. Yeah. Uh, just, it's just unfathomable. Like watching it at the time, I was just like, I don't know how he's doing this. Yeah. 
49 takedown attempts next to 338 strike attempts. Um, I don't think that number includes strikes on the ground and in the clinch, et cetera. So it's actually the number is higher. Let's see. N- total strikes, 401. Um, Jesus. And while those are staggering numbers, unbelievable numbers, they aren't. I mean, they are literally like it's twice as much or more than any other takedown <laughs> record he set. Still, they are in a pattern with other fights. It wasn't just a single special night from Marab. He is routinely attempting 15, 20 more uh, takedowns against a whole slew of opponents on his UFC record. The man is just a dynamo like we have never seen. And he uses it. I mean, he has really built his style to leverage that unbelievably unique advantage he has that he can just push people at a pace that we have never seen anybody else match. Um, so yeah, part of the difficulty is not knowing what the limits are, if there are any, to Marab's game. The other part of the difficulty is that Henry Cejudo is, I think, a much... Uh, he's, it's just harder to get a grasp of his game. It it changes so much in some ways from one fight to the next. All of his fights are punctuated by these really long periods of absence. Um, and, of course, Suhudo himself has some really, really stellar athleticism. Even now as an older man, he is clearly super fast, super strong, super durable um, in a way that the average fighter is not. But it's just harder to kind of get your hands around what approach Cejudo is going to take to any given opponent, how he's going to tailor his yeah. game. I think partially it's because he is, uh, it's because he is someone who kind of needs to keep himself interested. Yeah, and one of the ways he kind of does that is through reinvention. So whether that's building himself into a kind of that kind of karate counterpunching style that he had, uh-huh. or whether it's you know essentially learning to box at one point, and uh, you know, so I think, and you know, he, he clearly fancies himself an analyst, and I think that's one of the ways that he kind of gets his himself back into the sport because he's obviously also someone who can, who's not, uh, who's had problems kind of yeah motivating himself dropping out of things because he's not interested in them anymore. Yep. Yeah, I think he was a, uh, I think he, the story is sort of that he was like a nightmare student to his boxing coach. Mm-hmm. He was just the kind of guy you had to like just, you know, beat his ass to get him to like get in shape and cut weight and take his training seriously. And I think we definitely agree that he was kind of in that place for much of his early MMA career because he was just sort of beating people without having to think about it. And uh yeah, then Demetrius Johnson came along and he had to try to get good again. And he did. I mean, that's the thing about Henry Cejudo. If he is invested and interested, uh, it's difficult to know what the limits of his adaptability are. Uh, I mean, shit, he just revolutionized the hiring and firing process by recording himself <laughs> firing his, you know, decades long coach on camera. That was great. Really, uh, yes, innovatively gross. <laughs> he's, Really inventing new ways of being disrespectful and unlikable. But, uh. Yeah. People used to like me, and people used to dislike me just because I was a bit of a cringy dork. Yeah. Now let's try doing, doing something genuinely unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder how actual evil will strike them. Um. But yeah, that is the difficulty for me. Because my base reading is that. Uh, I have to assume everybody is going to have a horribly difficult time dealing with Marab Duwalish, really. As long as he keeps on in the direction he's been going, uh, and riding the confidence of his, that comes with the ability to just overwhelm everyone he goes up against. Um, I have to assume it's going to be difficult for everybody. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those things is that, you know, we talk about athleticism being a, a cheat factor, and that's because obviously there are points at which 
uh, athleticism just completely overrides technique and sort of technique considerations. You know, yeah. if someone was as fast as the flash, it wouldn't matter that they weren't trained because everyone would be moving in slow motion. If someone's like 10 times stronger than a human, it wouldn't matter if you right. know, they weren't trained in how to, you know, Marab is, has a physical gift that it is, is beyond like pretty much. Yeah. As I said, anything I've really seen in this sport. And I'm just like, maybe he can just do this to everyone. Yeah. Maybe just like literally everyone. He can just run into the clinch and then just keep doing it again until they're knackered. Yeah. Hey, a, a grizzly bear is Maybe a pretty, that... a, a grizzly bear in the wild is a pretty good wrestler. I don't know if you've ever seen bears fighting. Mm-hmm. They have wrestling technique, yeah. you know, they, 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 they do knee picks and yeah. shit on each other. They fight for underhooks. Say you raised a grizzly bear in captivity. It never got to learn to wrestle against another bear. It would still beat a guy in a fight. <laughs> That's the limits mm-hmm. of physicality or the extent of uh, physicality's effect on a fight. Certain point, you don't need yeah. any technique I mean, at all. Yeah, and that Jan fight for me, I was just like, man, maybe if he can do this to Jan, again, someone that I would have been like, if there's someone that will beat the yeah. Arab style, it is Jan. He is the worst matchup out there for him. He has incredible cardio. He's incred- He's really dangerous in the pocket. Uh, he's a fantastic anti-wrestler. Great counter-puncher. Kind of Hits like a truck. At yeah. All. Yeah. And yeah, so my my general thoughts, like, um, Cejudo's approach still does have a lot of that sort of, it, it's less attenuated and, and uh, accentuated than it used to be. Uh, it still has some of that sort of karate outside counterpunching yep. element to it. A lot of the, the, the Sterling fight was characterized by Sterling pressuring and Cejudo backing up early. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, you know, we mentioned that about older, older fighters. I think Cejudo just wants to be a slick fighter who doesn't have to do tons of things all the time. Doesn't want to be incredibly high pace. Yeah. So, and yeah, and he, he couldn't, and uh, Sterling has never had, like, amazing five-round cardio. No. And Cejudo wasn't like, I think Cejudo did win the fifth round, I believe. I can't remember. It was very. It was all very nit talk. Yeah. It wasn't exactly running, running out of the cage. No. No, he had trouble. Um, really, he had trouble really getting a foothold. Oh, I see. Yeah. And so, yeah, old, old Henry Cejudo. I mean, he might even be able. To, he'll be able to stop more takedowns than Piotr Jan. Certainly. Uh, because he's obviously a fantastic wrestler, but. Even if he does, will it matter? Or will Jan just drown him? Also, I have to say about this fight, this fight's bullshit. <laughs> Rob should just have a goddamn title He really should. Why is he not fighting for the title? Like, this is this is absolute horseshit that we're getting uh, Cheeto rather than Murab it really fighting is. for that belt. Yeah, it really is. I know the there's... other thing about, obviously... The other thing about the engine of someone like Murab is that, like, once it throws a gasket, he's going to explode. Yeah, like, yeah. Cain Velasquez had a few, like, a couple of years of his prime, admittedly a heavyweight, but then immediately just absolutely physically disintegrated. Yeah. Once this... something goes wrong with Marab physically, he will obviously instantly push himself to complete destruction. Yeah, the, like, s- the space shuttle loses one he's... of those little ceramic tiles. The whole thing fucking mm-hmm. explodes. It's because it's operating at such a high limit. Um, yeah, and he's he's going to do that himself. Yeah, he will just people will be like, "Oh yeah, Marab, you got a problem with your knee or whatever it is," and he will just fuck himself up the same way Velasquez did. Absolutely, almost certainly. I mean, and he's already and... in the specific context of fights as as unbelievably like one directional as almost all of his fights are. It's not like he never gets, like, chinned by somebody. He almost got knocked out mm-hmm. by Marlon Moraes, for fuck's sake. A shot Marlon Moraes. Yeah. He almost didn't make yeah. it through the three minutes of the fight that Moraes is actually capable of fighting. Um, yeah. Impressive that he did. That says something in and of itself. But still, uh, you know, the physicality overrides technique. But there are still holes. 
uh, to be poked. But I mean, yep. can you see Cejudo knocking him out? I mean, it's it's got to be the only way that he wins, right? It feels like the only way to win. And it's not impossible. Cejudo's not as fast as he was, but still fast. Got great timing. He certainly he hits pretty hard. But he doesn't knock a lot of people out. And Marab doesn't yeah. hasn't gotten knocked out yet. Uh, you know, Cejudo's going to stuff his takedowns better than uh, most people, absolutely. But then again, Piotr Jan stuffed, you know, geez, how many is it? 40. 35, I don't know. <laughs> Something, yeah. He, he, Marab only completed 11 of his 49 takedown attempts. The thing with Marab's game is, mm -hmm. if you allow him to get rolling, and good luck stopping him, you'd better knock him out. If you allow his momentum to build, it does not matter how effective each single technique is. That is the genius of pace fighting. It's the cumulative effect of everything coming at you from all angles and all levels at maximum intensity. And how can you keep up with that? And how can you establish a foothold and like stand your ground when the guy just doesn't care about what you're trying to do and will just keep trying to do everything at all times? Um, I'm picking Marab. You kind of you kind of got to, and yeah, get this man a goddamn title shot. He's a he's a frigging unicorn. <laughs> he he'd also never be never seen anyone like him. He'd also be he's, a great champion. Got he's got this a, over. Uh, go on, please. Yeah. The, the the fact that we've got two incredible potential title challenges, namely him and Sandhagen, waiting in the wings, and we have to watch the fucking meme matchup of. Uh, of Cheeto fighting Sugar for no reason whatsoever, apart from that, like they did it once before, yeah. is deeply galling. Yeah, it's not like Cheeto is. It's not quite this bad, but it it does feel like, uh, like when Bisping got to like pick his defenses. Yeah. You know, like Cheeto certainly has a better case than uh, the ninety-five-year-old Dan Henderson did, but he doesn't have a better case than Barab. And the sad thing is I was, I was starting to say before that Marab would be a really great champion. He's like really charming and funny, yeah. you know, <laughs> like he's got a great personality to have as the focal point of this super exciting division. Aside from the fact that I know people, uh, certain people can't stand fights like, like the Jose Aldo fight. It wasn't fun to watch. Um, Sometimes they're ugly. They're, they're usually grimy. But if you give Marab Duwalish Willie a spirited resistance, he is going to deliver fun fights because he's full tilt. Yep. Uh, yeah, he really should be getting a title shot. You're not wrong about that. But hey, he will almost certainly get one if he gets through Cejudo. That's how it feels anyway. And. In, you mean interim title shot against Corey <laughs> Sandhagen? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I just gotta pick Marab. And it's weird to pick him. You have to. Yeah, with the feeling that like a, just so much of what he's trying to do is probably gonna be neutralized by Cejudo's footwork and his distance management and his takedown defense and, and wrestling ability, but. It's just hard to see Cejudo getting enough time to do anything to actually win the rounds if Marab's approach uh, remains what it what it has been. Yeah, it seems like it seems absolutely like in, incredible that you. I'm just picking someone to just essentially out physical Henry Cejudo. Yeah, but that's kind of what I have to do. Yeah. Who knows, man? Uh, what would be really cool is if this is uh, the dynamic we saw against Ricky Simone finally rearing its head again. Because mm -hmm. that was an amazing fight, and so much of it had to do with Simone being just an unbelievable wrestler and scrambler. And so they yep. were just like 
evenly matched and both going full tilt at all times. I would love to see Cejudo just forced into a ton of wrestling exchanges and see how he deals with them. It would be pretty amazing if he could turn that particular side of uh, Marab's all-out full pace game against him. You know, yep. win some scrambles, get some control time, actually uh, effectively counter that. That that That's maybe the other way of winning. It's hard to picture, but it is possible that uh, he could just be a, you know, a better mat wrestler, better control wrestler than Marab and, and win some key reversals. But, man, he's going to have to do it a lot. <laughs> just a lot mm-hmm. to actually win. Yep. I mean, this is his chance to, like, really... Because, yeah, a lot, a lot of his sort of, you know, triple C stuff is somewhat buttressed by fights against old people. Very um, much so. And this is basically his chance to prove how great he is. Yeah. Why does Cejudo get so many chances to prove how great he is? Because uh, he's beaten some really good people, I guess. Yeah, and then he just disappears for three years and comes back and gets another shot against a really good person. Or at Uh least uh, sometimes a formerly really good person. Yes. Well, at least, yeah, he's not fighting a Dominic Cruz or a Cody Garbrandt or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Or even, like I say, like a Davis and Figueredo or something. He's fighting someone very much in his prime. And uh, I think... That will also do it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. I'm Connor. That's Phil. You can find us using those names on social media. Wait, except me. My name is nowhere on my social media. I'm actually Boxing Bush. Phil uh, is both Evil Greg Jackson and Phil McKenzie on Twitter. You can find both of us there. Check out the Patreon. There is a whole lot of other... Uh, stuff we discussed, not only from the UFC 298 undercard, but uh, from last week's, um, you know, quite interesting fight night uh, main card. So make sure you check out the uh, Heavy Hands Patreon and listen to that. Next week, of course, we will be back to talk to you about whatever the hell happens uh, at uh, UFC 298. There's another card just a week after that, which features Brandon Moreno versus Brandon Royval 2. Once again, fighting for the flyweight title. Also, Yair Rodriguez versus Brian Ortega on that card. Um, it's a little more limited. It, it's, you know, the lineup is uh, catering more to the local Mexican audience than it is to the best fighters in respective divisions. But hey, it's a fight night with a title fight, so the standard is lower. It's not a title fight, though, is it? Yeah, it, isn't it? Oh, wait, no. Royval lost. Doi. It's a number one contender's fight. Still, five-round main event. Royval Moreno. Good main event. Happy to look forward to that. And we will have to uh, squeeze... Yeah, it will be great. Yeah. Well, the last it one was, be... you know, yeah. very one-sided, to be fair. Yes. Still, it's worth. Yeah, it'll be one of the ones where, uh, like, Brandon Moreno will will look like a star in this environment, and that will be cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a fight worth making and worth watching, certainly. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we'll talk about that next week. Uh, until then, I hope you're looking forward to it as much as us. And if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. <laughs>